receive your word as it goes forth and the worship today that we may worship together the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. The Lion of Judah that breaks every chain. Let every chain be broken today that would bind the people, Lord, that are calling on your name today. For you said, Lord, if we call upon the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Lord, as we lift you up, you will draw all men unto you. And as we praise you, you will add unto the church daily such as should be saved. And we rejoice in you today, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord, hallelujah. Praise God. You know, the disciples, when Jesus sent the disciples out, to heal the sick and to set the captive free. But when they came back, and Luke says, Luke 10, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice, don't just rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Are you, is your name written since morning in heaven on the Lamb's book of life? Praise you. Do you have that assurance today, that confidence that you're ready to meet him? You know, this could be the day, the coming of the Lord. We know not what the day may bring. How we, how we should be serious about every day that we live and give God thanks for his daily strength. So today as we gather here today, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May the Lord heal you if you need healing, deliver you if you need deliverance. But mainly, if you don't know Jesus, make sure today that you know him. Praise God. So we thank you, Lord. Lord, as the musicians play and as the worshipers worship, let your anointing be upon each one of them. Let them be free in the Holy Ghost this morning, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's rejoice. You know, there's a word I heard the name, the word rejoice means to jump up and down and spin around, <laughs> Pastor Mario. That's what this means. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's do it. Good morning, church. We can do much better. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice. Amen. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We have to be so grateful to God that many people who have slept last night did not wake up. But God has still put breath in our nostrils to wake up this morning and give him all the glory. Amen. Are we all ready to worship the Lord God most high? Can we just close our eyes and lift our hands up unto Jesus and tell him, Lord, as we worship here, we ask that we, we welcome you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you will have your way, Father. You will have your way, Lord. Holy Spirit, you will have your way. Lord, we offer up our hearts, our lives, our desires, our dreams, our sorrows, our joys unto you. Lord, we ask that you will be glorified. You will be glorified. And we welcome you to have your way, O oh Father. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Shall we sing this song together? Spirit. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shall we give a big, big hand unto Jesus and welcome him this morning? Amen. Amen. How many of you say that you want to see this land healed? How many of you agree that this land has bondage? Our land has bondages. And only Jesus can set it free. Amen. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. But the revival has to start in us first. Amen. In our families first. In the church and then in the nation. Today, shall we believe that as we look into Jesus, as we touch heavens, he will give us grace to change this earth. Can you, can you all do that with me? Touching heavens. All kids, yes, amen. Touching heavens, changing earth. Yeah, are you ready? Can we do this song together? Amen, let's do this. existed between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit He extended His love to us and we here are called to reflect that same love He 
is filled with compassion, right? With mercy and grace. Because on that cross, when he spread his hands, the nailed hands, no human could ever do that. But Jesus, the form of God, descended down to the earth and died for our sins. And only he was able to do it because he was born of virgin. He was born without sin. Amen. And let us all sing this song with love towards our Father, towards Jesus and the Holy Spirit who been with us. You know, it's not something that happened in the first century or, you know, at the, at, at, um, at the time when Jesus was there. We've been witnessing the same miracles, the same works that have been happening in the, among the Christians and the non-believers even today. That's because the word is alive. Amen? So let us all sing this song, lifting our hearts up towards our Father.
Such a lovely Father we worship. His grace knows no bounds. Amen. Father, we worship you. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you for your mercy, Father. Thank you. I always have this picture in front of my eyes. Let's just imagine that we were, you know, we were slaves. You know, uh, like how we have flea market. Back days, they used to have slave markets. So we were slave to sin. We, have, we were slave to curses. We were slave to bondages, right? But Jesus just walks by and says that, hey, you, I need you. And I tell him that I'm a slave. I don't have any money or I don't have anything with me. But Jesus steps forward and says that I have paid it all for you. I've paid it all for you. What an amazing grace. What an amazing grace just for you and me, just for everyone in this house, just for everyone in this world. He has paid it all. What an amazing grace. What a great God we serve. What a loving Father we serve. Ways that 
now all thrones and dominions, Lord. Your name stands above them all, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Let the angels cry. Oh, holy, all creation cry. Oh, holy, let me keep it high. Oh, holy, holy. salvation Lord. without you on the cross father we wouldn't know what grace is Lord and we would have just lived in our sinful lives father. but Lord thank you we thank you from all our hearts Lord that even after 2,000 years Lord that blood that you shed, Lord, still saves us, Father. It redeemed us from our sinful lives, Lord, and made us worthy to stand here and worship you, O Lord. And we'll sing, Father, with the angels, Lord. Holy, all creation's cries. Alpha and Omega, Lord. We lift you, O Lord. Let our worship be sweet incense in your presence, Father. We praise you, Lord. to work among us Father we are going to witness healing Lord we are going to witness testimonies in this place rise up Father and we thank you Holy Spirit we thank you for this present for the presence here we worship you move among us Father let your name be glorified Prepare our hearts to receive your word, Father. Soften our hearts, Lord, so that those words may enter into our heart and help us to give fruit. 
to your kingdom, Father. Be glorified, Father. Lead us, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you for the presence in this place, Father. We give the rest of the time into your hands, Jesus. Lead us in your most precious and holy name. We ask and pray. Amen. 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 Can we give a big, big hand unto Jesus? We may be seated in God's presence. Okay, how amazing it was, God's presence. We move into the announcements. So, we have daily prayer in online connect at 8.30 p.m. Uh, it's such a joy to pray as a church, you know. And if you are not able to, I want to encourage each and every one of you to join there. And if you're not able to join every day, it will be great if you could join one day. I think it's a joy and a privilege to pray for a church. And... Uh, Bible study happens on Monday, 7 p.m. at Online Connect in Tamil. So if you have never been a part of it, I think you are missing big time. Uh, we've been learning the word and how we can get closer to God. It's amazing how God uses that time to get closer to him. So I encourage each and every one of you who is part of the Tamil service to be part of the, of the Bible study. Yeah. Next is on Tuesday, we have Women's Fellowship at Online Connect at 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's for both Tamil and English. And uh, on Wednesday, we have Midweek Service at 11 p.m. at church. And on Friday, we have Night of Prayer uh, at 10 p.m. at church. And we have one very important announcement. So this Saturday, the July 1st, uh, we have uh, Dawn Prayer at 5 a.m at Online Connect, and uh, it's a joy to come together in God's presence the first day of the month, and uh, I know it, it speaks to me as well. I also should be part of it, so I encourage each and every one of you to be part of it. Next is we have this online resources uh, from uh, Right Now Media. It is for children, youth, women, men, and families. I know a lot of people are using it, and if you're not being, if you're not using it, I encourage you to use the Right Now Media, and we have a lot of uh, individual uh, accounts so that everyone can be benefited out of it. And uh, we have special events coming up, and uh, I think it's summer, and we are all excited about it. We have church picnic on July 8th. Please mark your calendars and keep yourselves free. July 8th, church picnic, and August 4th to 6th, we have camp at Brayside. Yeah, I find it difficult to pronounce, but Brayside. So uh, registrations have already started, and if you have not yet registered, please contact Hemaka to register. And the last day for registration is on July 9th. Okay, I repeat once again, the registrations have already been started, and if you have not yet registered, please register with the Hemaka, and the deadline for that is July 9th. And we have August 8th to 12th, we have EBS. For more details, you can contact Seema and uh, Christina Ka. And we have another very important uh, event coming up, which is the WOW concert on September 23rd. I know it's, it's uh, you, we've done it last year also, and this year also we're gonna do it. And it's, a, it's kind of an outreach where we could invite a lot of people and get to know, uh, let them know God. So more than anything, uh, I would encourage each one of you to pray for these events. As a church, if we can pray for these events, it will be great. And we know that God will do great things through these events. And next week, uh, Sunday service, we have morning uh, Tamil service at 9 a.m., English service at 11.30 a.m., and Spanish service at 2 p.m. And uh, next is baptism. So if any of you want to get baptized, uh, there's a procedure to do it, and I think if you are interested in getting baptized, please contact Pastor James. And if you have any doubts, you can contact the church office. I think the email is there, connect at revivalwaves.org. If you have any doubts regarding baptism, or if you want to get baptized, and if you are led to be baptized, I request you to please contact Pastor James. Yeah, next we have the birthday wishes. Today we have uh, Joan Elias son of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ebenezer, celebrating his third birthday. <laughs> you know what? I was speaking to Ebenezer yesterday, and he said he's going to take us to Five Star Hotel today after the service. All of us are welcome. 
26th June, we have Brother Stephen Jabakumar <laughs> celebrating his birthday. And I think Shweta has also planned some surprise. And 27th, it's uh, Hema Aka and Isaac. 20? 27th, right? Yeah, 27th. Hema Aka and uh, Hans Isaac. Isaac, you want to say something? Do you have anything for us? Or we will barge into your house. Okay. And then uh, 28th, we have Pastor Mario. Wow. Pastor. We will be there at your house as well, Pastor, on 28th. 29th, Ralph Manikraj, Ralph Uncle and Sister Ashwi Johnson. So we have so many birthdays this week. And I think uh, we have a lot of treats coming up our way. And finally, we have this prayer request. Uh, if you have any prayer request, you can contact the given number, 437-500-6462. Or you can uh, email us to prayers at revivalwaves.org. Connect at revivalwaves.org. So if you have any doubts, further any doubts, please, please contact the church office or Pastor James. Thank you. So all the birthday babies, may I ask you to stand for a minute? Birthday babies. You know, the good thing I would say, go to, uh, uh, first, whose birthday? The, can you put that birthday? Yeah, first thing is today is, so today we are starting to celebrate from today. So uh, I don't know what hotel he's going to take us to. Anyway, uh, restaurant, we'll go. Okay. So we start from today. And then 26th, we go to Brother Stephen's house. And then 27th, we go to... Our house, <laughs> our house, and then straight we go to Pastor Mario's house, then we have the swimming pool, we enjoy there, and then we come next week to church. <laughs> what a joy, what a joy, isn't it? May I ask Pastor, please, uh, the birthday, those who are celebrating their birthdays, what about the anniversaries, like uh, we don't have anyone here? Okay, the birthday babies to come, and I would like uh, Pastor, Pastor to pray, pray for them. Yes, please come, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Birthday, Stephen, brother, yes. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Pastor Mario, yes. Hallelujah. Lord, you said that surely mercy and goodness shall follow. We pray that these children, Lord, be blessed as they have been all these years. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in their lives. As we worshipped you this morning, Lord, your grace is more than enough for us, Lord. Father, I pray that the spirit of wisdom will guide them, Lord. Lord, I pray that the blood of Jesus will protect them, Lord, throughout this year. Lord, I pray that surely, surely, this year be a blessed year for them, Lord. Unlike the past years, Lord, a new venture, a new gift that you would be giving them, Lord, this year, I pray. Lord, those who are anointed, those who are given the gift of healing, gift of uh, prophecy, Lord, let their boundaries be increased. People be blessed, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that their family will see their hand as a blessed hand, Lord. All their hard efforts will come to their home in fullness, Lord, because you are the God who provides them, Lord. Oh, bless them, guide them, keep them joyful under your mighty wings. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Hello, God bless you. Happy birthday. Bless you, Pastor. Happy birthday. Happy birthday in advance. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Isaac and Hema are going to give a big party, eh? Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. So, before we go for the offer tree, I just want to introduce anyone who is here for the first time. I, th I know a brother and sister all the way from U.S. Yes, Kevin, could you please stand? Uh, yeah, we want to welcome you in the matchless name of Jesus. Um, yeah, you can introduce. It's better you say about yourself than we say. Yes, Kevin? Hi. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Praise so the Lord. It's wonderful and great, and it's God's blessing that I could be with my parents for this vacation. Yes. And, uh, I got a vacation for one week, and they, it's gla I'm glad they could join from U.S. U.S., yeah. uh, Pennsylvania, right? Uh, South no, Carolina. South Carolina, okay. All the way. You drew or you flew? I flew. Okay, 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 yeah. yeah. They are going to be stay, 
staying here for a week. Yeah. Okay. Those who have good things about Kevin, reach to me. <laughs> Those who have something to tell about Kevin to his, their parents, reach to them. <laughs> he's such a lovely boy. Like uh, ever since he came, we have noticed that uh, he's so um, he's so jealous for God. Like he he wants to be in the church or pray or even his personal prayer. I have seen. Um, honestly, telling like you should be proud of raising your son like this. Amen. You know, praise be to God. Welcome. We welcome you. Thanks for joining, and we will be in connect. Uh, we will be in connection with you so that uh, any help here. We are here to take care. If he is uh, doing something naughty, let us know. <laughs> yes, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, please, Thank you may you. be seated. Yes. And um, uh, yeah, one other thing I just want to tell you, those who have already shown interest to learn theological studies, please stay back. I have something to tell you, something to share with you. Theological studies, because uh, we have Pastor Dr. Gary M.P., the president of uh, Global University. I don't know how many of you heard about president of Global University. Global University is one of the well-renowned universities here in North America, like uh, known for theological studies. So um, our district is affiliate. Uh, our district is in connection with Masters University and Global University. You, he would be able to give you a lot more information if you have any doubt, any clarification, and. Um, uh, Pastor, could you please stand? I just want to welcome you on behalf of Revival Waves of Christ. There we go. Pastor <laughs> Dr. Gary MP, President, Global University. He's going to be the spe special speaker for us today. He's going to share the word, and I believe God is going to speak to our hearts this morning. And may let me welcome Auntie. Yes, uh, Carol. Auntie, let Auntie stand. Yes, Auntie, you should have stood up. Yes, welcome. This is uh, Carol's mother. Yeah. You want to have a mic, Auntie? Maybe you want to. Yeah, no? Shy? <laughs> okay. Carol's mother, all the way from India, came here to help uh, Carol and our little lazy. Welcome, Auntie. Welcome. Uncle is missing you, and you are missing him, I know. And by the way, he's a pastor there, pastoring about 10 plus churches, or 10, 20, how many, Carol? 20? 40 churches. 40 churches. He's a pastor for 40 different churches. Praise be to God. It's, a, it's an honor to have you, Auntie, with us. God bless. So before we go for the message, let us uh, sow in the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God. Come on, let us take the offertory. Ashes, could you please come forward? Pastor Mario, could you please come and pray for the offering? Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> praise the Lord praise. hallelujah praise the Lord Father we give you thank you for this morning for your presence of the Holy Spirit ministering to your people Lord now there is a very important moment right now in the name of Jesus we bring our, our offerings unto you Lord uh, thank you for the health that you have given us to us and we can work and make money and bring this money here to your house multiply and glorify your name jesus amen amen so it's time for the sunday school kids could you please all could you all please come here <clears throat> all sunday school kids yes and those who are standing behind you can come forward as the seats are getting free Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Hallelujah. Pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for these wonderful gifts that you have given to us. Lord, may we be careful of uh, the way we raise them up, Lord. Lord, we pray that uh, the heavenly wisdom be upon them. The Spirit of God guide them, Lord. Lord, we pray that these children will raise as Joshua, Caleb, Esther, Deborah. Lord, may these children conquer this land, Lord, for you. May our children be protected, Lord. May the Sunday school be an instrument for them to learn more about you, our dear Jesus. And I pray that the teachers be blessed, given the heavenly wisdom, Lord. And Lord, I pray that as parents, may we, we give our 
100% cooperation, Lord, so that our kids will be raised in your way. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Yes. Um, with that, a uh, few more things to go. Maybe we will keep that for the for the end. May Shall we clap and welcome Pastor Gary MP, the president of Global University, to share the word with us today. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you so much. Good morning. Dios te bendiga en todos. I understand we have some Espanol, so I say we welcome you and we thank God for the privilege of being with you this morning to share the word. Thank you, Pastor James, for the invitation. I'm not quite sure how our paths crossed, but I think Cuba was involved in it somehow and then Global University. Let me just clarify, I'm the president of Global University in Canada because Global University is in 164 countries around the world and the international office is in Springfield, Missouri, where the Assemblies of God own the whole town. Um, but uh, it's a great joy for me to be with you here this morning and to share the word and how important it is that we take time to be in his word. Amen? How critical it is. You know, you realize that we are in the third day. Jesus said, after three days, he will rise from the dead. And in the third day, I believe he is returning. And then we cross that threshold in the new millennium, and this we are in that third day. Now, we don't know the day or the hour, but we do know that he is coming, and I believe it's sooner and sooner and sooner. And so we need to study to show ourselves approved, able work persons, rightly dividing the word of truth, because Jesus said in the last days such a strong delusion will come upon the earth that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Wow. So, brothers and sisters, the only thing that's going to keep us from being strongly deluded and being deceived is the knowledge of this word. And we must, the word must remain in us, and we must remain in the word. Maybe I'll preach John 15 instead, but no, <laughs> I'll stick with the message the Lord gave me. But it's a great joy for me to be with you here this morning. And if the brothers could just bring up the first slide, I want to introduce uh, my, my family. This is Team MP. Uh, on the far right is my son-in-law, Michael. Next to him is my daughter, Felicia, whose birthday is going to be on the 27th. And, and, and uh, next to her, and, and she's holding a Joey, uh, or one of our, my other son. And then next to her is her sister, Julia. And then next to her is my wife, Marilka. And Marilka and, and, and Julia are in Europe touring right now. I had just come back from the UK. My, my daughter, Julia, is studying at the University of Cambridge. And my, my wife is holding Dolly, who also is having her birthday on the 27th of June. So add those to your list of June birthdays for, for Felicia and for Dolly. And when I say Team MP, it's because my, my ministry in Cuba has been for more than 30 years now. Started at Missa Gospel Temple. And um, it's been a great joy to be there, but it wouldn't have happened without the support of my family, my team at home, praying for me, supporting, coming, going. My wife has been many times. My oldest daughter, Felicia, taught English as a second language to the national leadership of the Assemblies of God in Cuba. My daughter, Julia, has been there on several missions trips. In fact, they went there in grade eight. Their, our, our rite of passage in our home was in grade eight that you got to go on your first missions trips. And I would encourage you, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, to facilitate the young people from go, being able to go on a missions trip when it's reasonable and, that, and, and as soon as possible. I mean, it's one thing to sit and to watch a world vision, you know, uh, presentation about the challenges and the needs around the world. But it's another thing to actually experience it. That changes the life of our children. It changes our lives. It changes my life every time I go down there and I see our brothers and sisters who love the Lord in such need. It really makes me appreciate how much and how blessed we are here in Canada. Amen? So this morning I want to talk to you about, well, I consider it one of the most important sermons that you could ever hear because 
Let me ask you this question. If you knew that you were going to be leaving and the last, you were going to have an opportunity to share the last words with your children, your spouse, your brothers, your sisters, do you think those would be important words that you'd want to share? You'd want to make sure they were the right words, that they were going to get the message across as to what was most important on your heart. And so that's the message I want to share with you this morning. And, and I'm going to call it the Great Mission now. I guess you've talked about the Great Commission, which is go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Great Commission. That's what he's committed us to do. But the question is, how do we do it? And I believe the last words of Jesus are the Great Mission. It's the how-to part of the Great Commission. And if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus said to them, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. It is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet that we will not walk in darkness. We thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters here this morning. And Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding that we might just not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. That you would accomplish your will, plan, and purposes for me coming here today. And we thank you for that. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So these are the last words that Jesus spoke, and then he ascended into heaven. They think that there was over 500 eyewitnesses at the ascension. And it's interesting about that, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But he said, but the question he asks is, who will? Jesus says, you. Who's a you? Okay. The text indicates that Jesus is talking to his disciples or to disciples. And it's what question we have to ask ourselves this morning is what makes a disciple? Does being here in church make us a disciple? No, not necessarily. It, it's a good thing to do, but it doesn't make us a disciple. Does reading the Bible make us a disciple? It's a good thing, but it doesn't make us a disciple. Does doing all the things that we think are religious and church-wise important for us to do make us a disciple? They're good and they're important, but they're not the things that make us a disciple. One of the things that I always challenge about, Pastor, when I go to visit somebody, I say, well, when do you do discipleship? And they say, well, we do it on Tuesday nights. I say, excuse me, you do discipleship on Tuesday nights? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we, every Tuesday night we, we do discipleship. And I said, well, how, can, how do you do discipleship on Tuesday nights? And they would explain to me they had a class and they taught the people. And I said, so you're teaching the people about discipleship, but when do you actually do discipleship? And that's an important question because I think our view on a lot of things, and I'm going to say this to you in all kindness, you know you're all, you think you're Tamil, you're Spanish, you're English, whatever. No, you're all Greeks. You say, what do you mean? I'm not, I have no Greek blood in me at all. No, 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 you're all Greeks. The way you have learned, the way you interpret the Bible, the way that you look at the world is based on a Greek methodology. That's the way the Western world operates, is on a Greek worldview. And that means that we have a certain way that we construct the world around us and interpret it and make sense of it. Now, what does that mean to us? It means that we can know about something intellectually. The Greeks were very intellectual. They were very knowledgeable about how to do philosophy and that, and they could know about something, but that doesn't mean that they know something. Now, if you go on the other side and you go the Hebrew and some of the Eastern way of thinking, to say I know something means I have experienced it. I have done it. And if you know some of the definitions of the word to know, he said he knew her, and then he knew her. Now, the one is to knew, know her maybe as a sister or a mother, and the other is to know her as a spouse. Same word, different context, different meaning. And so we have to understand that when we know something, is it an intellectual knowing or is it an experiential knowing? When we say we know God, does that mean we know about him? 
Or do we know him in our hearts? And do we know him in the way that we live our lives? That's what discipleship is about. I can say I'm a disciple, but do I know discipleship? Am I a disciple in the way I live my life? And Jesus talked in very different times. He mentions ways. He said, they will know you, my disciples, if you keep my commandments. Okay? There's the Ten Commandments. And it's interesting. One time I was sitting there reading my Bible and meditating on it. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Gary, what are the Ten Commandments? No, I'd been through seminary. I'd been pastoring for probably about 20 years when I, Holy Spirit, that's me. So I went, uh, I think I got up to about eight or nine, and then I wasn't so sure. So then I went to the next pastor's office, and I said, Karen, I said, what are the Ten Commandments? And she rattled them off, and of course, ladies always know everything, you know. And so then I went to the youth pastors. Well, I don't think he got three or four. And then I went to the next one and the next one, and only one pastor out of a staff of about 13 pastors knew the Ten Commandments. And I thought to myself, well, how can we keep the commandments if we don't know the commandments? So now I have a little plaque in my office with the Ten Commandments sitting where I, can, I look at it every single day. We need to be reminded. Now, it's important to have the commandments written upon your heart, but one of the ways we write it on our heart is we see it with our eyes, we take it into our lives, and God puts it onto our heart. And so we can know about discipleship, we can know about the commandments, but whether or not they're actually a part of who we are, that's a whole different question. So what makes a disciple? His disciple is his will. That's what God wants. He wants to have his will be done in you, in me, as it is in heaven. You know, when we pray that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy will be done on earth, right? Right? Do you know that word can be translated in earth? What are you made of? Dirt. <laughs> we came from the dirt. We are earth. Now, if God's will is going to be done over the whole earth, wouldn't it be important for it to start in this little bit of earth? Thy will be done in this earthen vessel as it is in heaven. If it's not done in my life, who, what, what difference does it make about the rest of the earth? Because it starts with me. Even a sister said, the revival starts in me. It starts in us. Jesus says his disciples do his will. It indicates an, a choice, the act or process or de, of desire to follow after Jesus, to do his will. And the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, are we willing? And everybody, of course, says, oh, yeah, I'm willing. Until the challenges come, till the trials come, till the difficulties come, eh, maybe we're not so willing then. When he says to you, you know what? I want you to do sacrificial giving this morning, and I want you to give everything that's in your checking account. God ever said that to you? He said that to me. He tested me. He said, now I'm going to put your money where your mouth is, Gary. You know, are you willing to give all the money that's in your checking account? I said, but Lord, I... I, I the rent and the, uh, uh, and he says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And every once in a while, he'll put that test to the challenge to see whether or not we really trust him. Are we really willing to follow after him? For what? To receive. To receive what? His power. You know, a lot of us can do very well in our Christian lives because we have got strong character, strong ideas, strength of character that we can just will things to be done. But there's always going to be something that we come across in our lives that we can't do it. <laughs> Sickness comes along and challenges come along at work and challenges come along in our home life and our parenting and our marriages and, and we can't do it. So we need his power to accomplish the things that we want. So what kind of power are we talking about? What's the source of that power? That source of that power is the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember I mentioned there were about 500 eyewitnesses at the ascension, and he's speaking to them all, and he says, I want you to go into Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon you, right? Isn't that what he said? Now, how many people ended up in the upper room? 120. Now, 500, 120. What happened to the other 380? 
Ever think about that? I mean, I, I, I'm funny enough that when I read things, there's the explicit things, the things that are right in front of you, but then there's the implicit things, the things that are implied but not necessarily there. Well, there's 380 people that didn't show up at the party and missed out on that initial infilling of the Holy Spirit. What happened to them? I think a lot of them were like the people in the parable that Jesus gave. Some went off because they had to prove a piece of land. Some had to go off because they wanted to check out a couple of, of, of ox of yoke, yoke of ox. <laughs> they made all kinds of excuses because Jesus never said to them how long it was going to be. If you think we're busy, boy, they must have been really busy that they were too busy to receive the power that Jesus promised to them. But they had excuses. They had reasons. And how many times did God ask us as his disciples to tarry, to wait? The brother was up here sharing about the prayer times, the early prayer times, the later prayer times. And, he's, and I'm sensing he's, he's almost having to beg to get people to come out and pray. That ought not to be brothers and sisters. Whenever there's an opportunity to pray, we should be there. How many need prayer in your life? I need prayer every single day. Every day I, I need to say, Holy Spirit, you got to help me. And so that power is there for us, but we have to be willing to receive it. And if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoken in other tongues, then I would really encourage you, talk to pastor, seek it. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues before I ever met a Pentecostal. You know how it happened? I read the Bible. And I was foolish enough to believe what the Bible said. And I saw that something happened to those guys who were, you know, waiting in that upper room. There was, Peter was denied, still hiding, and a bunch of them had gone off hiding, and a bunch of them were this and that. And then all of a sudden, this event happened in Acts chapter 2, and it changed their lives. And I said, Lord, whatever you did in them, I want you to do it in me, because I need that power. If I don't get that power, I'm not going to survive as a Christian. And I had a Damascus Road conversion on February the 10th, 1980. God called me out of the world, spoke to me in an audible voice as I'm speaking to you right now, and called me. And yet still, I knew that I needed his Holy Spirit power to enable me to live the life. Because I wasn't going to be able to do it in my own strength. I recognize that I'm a weak human vessel. But I can do all things through Christ's spirit who strengthens me. Amen? Amen. 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 So are we willing to be his what? His witnesses. So we got the guy with his hand on his Bible swearing to be a witness, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help him God. And that's what we are being challenged by the Lord in Acts 1 verse 8 to do, is to be his witnesses. And what is, but what does it mean to be a witness? Next slide. Witness of what? Well, everybody here, I would hope, and if you're not, then come up and see me afterward, are a witness of God's saving power. If you're here this morning, it's because God has saved you, called you out of the world, set you free in order to serve him. And if you've experienced that saving power and the change it brings you, how many when you gave your life to the Lord, it, it, it changed your life in some way? If it didn't, then I'm, I'm, you, know, you need to come up and get saved this morning. Because if it didn't touch you and say, change you in some way, it could have been a bad attitude, a bad habit, or whatever it was. But and here's the two true litmus test. Did people see the change in you? Not you, but other people. I was at York University when I got saved, and people were coming up to me saying, you know, Gary, you used to have the foulest mouth I ever heard on anybody. Because I would curse and swear in front of whoever it was and whenever I wanted to because I didn't care about man, woman, or mouse. And they said, but something's happened to you. And this is before I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, well, you know, I'd become a Christian, you know. <laughs> I didn't have the power to be a witness yet. But I had been changed. So we're witnesses of God's saving power. And, 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 and in that, it can be delivering power. How many here have had the the hand of God, the spirit of God, deliver you from addictions or compulsions and other things in your life. That was me. 
I grew up in the 60s and 70s in Canada, and our three gods were sex and drugs and rock and roll. And those are bondages that I had in my life that only God could set me free from. And so I experienced God's delivering power. So when I talk to addicts, and I've been working with addicts for over 30 years now, I can tell you God can set you free. He did it for me, and he can do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. So we can be a witness of God's saving power, God's delivering power, God's transforming power to change us from one thing into another, from an ain't into a saint. And that's the power of God to change us, to transform us into his image, that they might see Jesus in us. We have an expression, I like to say, we want to have a hug or a, or a touch from Jesus with skin on. It's nice to pray to Jesus, and he's in, he's in the spirit. But every once in a while, it's nice to have Jesus with skin on. Amen? Amen? And that's what your pastor is, and that's what your other people are who are real Jesus followers. And Jesus, when you, when you touch them, you're touching the Lord himself. His transforming power. God's forgiving power to forgive us of our sins, to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And not just for the big stuff and the stuff that we started off with, but every single day. His ability to forgive us and to help us. As we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. Amen? Amen. And we can talk about that because people think that they can't come to church, they can't come to God because they're too dirty. I'm too unworthy. And all of us are unworthy. It's by his grace. He's talked about it. You sing about it. But it's that grace that gives that transforming power of forgiveness. It's about God's friendship. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have never, one of the things I struggled with before I was a Christian was being, that sense of being alone in the world. You know, I had lots of friends at university, you know, as long as I had a cold one in the fridge and a bag in the drawer, I had lots of friends. But the minute I stopped doing all that stuff, they were all gone. And so I felt the real sense of aloneness, but then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit and God come into my life, and I, he said, I will be a friend who will stick closer than a brother. And I have never had that gripping sense of aloneness. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, said it was that dark night of the soul when you're all alone. I've never had that feeling ever again since I met the Lord. We are witnesses of God's love. And we say, well, we, people know what love is. No, they don't. They know what Hollywood tells them, what Harlequin tells them. But they don't know what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Love is kind. Love is just. Love is forgiving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't know the agape love of God. And that's the only kind of selfless love that really changes people's lives. That we can be a witness of the fact that we have experienced the love of God through Christ Jesus in a way we could never dream or imagine, and it's changed my life. We are witnesses of the fact that God has the answers to the great questions of life. Do you know that every single human being who's ever lived on the planet Earth, on any culture, any place, any time, has asked three questions? Every single one culture. Anthropologists have studied this for hundreds of years, and the same three questions keep coming up. Now, this, is, this is classroom time. So what's one of the three great questions? Come on. You know. You, you're asking them yourselves. Come on. Don't be shy. There's no wrong answers. You can just say whatever you like. Sorry? Yeah. Where do I go to? Okay. If, there, if there's a where do I go to question, there has to be a... Why am I here? Sorry? I'm sorry. Am I doing God's will? Well, that, that's a good question, but it's not one of the three great questions. We got where am I going and why am I here? And if you got where are you going, you have to have where did I come from? Where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? Those are the three great questions of life that every single one of you know the answer to. And if you don't, read the Bible. 
Now, I could give you the answer right now, but that wouldn't be helpful. I want you to read your Bible. So your homework after today is to discover what are the answers to the three great questions of life. Or you could come and study at Global University, and we'll teach you that. <laughs> so Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. And we know witnesses of what? His power, his transforming power, his delivering power, his forgiveness, his friendship, his love. And enter the three great questions of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And then he tells us where. Not only that he's calling us to be his witnesses, but where. He tells us where to do it. First of all, he says in Jerusalem. Well, is he meaning Jerusalem, the city? Yeah, to the people he was speaking to. But none of us live in Jerusalem now. So our Jerusalem could be Mississauga, could be Brampton, could be anywhere else. Scarborough? Okay. Come on. I heard there's somebody from another country here. Yeah, well, no, they don't live there. They used to. Newfoundland, see? We'll get to that in a minute. I think they fall under Samaria, but that's another question. They're part of Canada, but they're not part of Canada, like the Samaritans were. Anyway, the point is, is that I'm going to say that you're... Jerusalem is actually the street on which you live or the building on which you live in. Now, when we used to have live on a house in the street, now we've, I say we haven't downsized, we've right-sized because now I got a lawn boy, a pool boy, a snow boy. I don't got to do any of that stuff. Oh, boy. And uh, I just turned 70 my last birthday in April, and I don't want to do any of that stuff anymore, so I right-sized into a condominium. But... My Jerusalem is that building, named, interestingly enough, the Lighthouse. And my Jerusalem is to all the people in the Lighthouse, to pray for them all, to get to know their names. When the opportunity presents itself, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within me. Amen? And you should know, if you're on a street, all the people's names. Start writing them down. House 149, 151 and start writing the names of the people down and start praying for them and then start to pray for divine appointments to meet them. Now, I'm going to give you a little insiders on this. Remember in the family picture? You know who the big two big evangelists are in my family? My two daughters? No. My wife? No. My son-in-law? No. They're all do their thing. Joey and Dolly. Exactly, Pastor. It's the dogs because you got to get out and walk them. And when you're walking out on the street, you get to meet your neighbors. And people stop and talk to you about your dogs and this and that. And that's how we got to know our neighbors on different places. Because it's funny, because I had a Cuban pastor with me one time. And he came in the, in the middle of winter. And we had about three feet of snow on the ground. He goes, Brother MP, he goes, how do you evangelize in this country? Because in Cuba, they all sit in their front doors. And they're all talking, blah, 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 blah. And so... He goes, how do you do it here? And I said, well, Peter, I said, it's not easy. I said, because everybody hibernates for about eight months in this country. And then for two months, we all sit in the backyard. We never sit in the front. You ever notice that about Kenny? We love the backyard. So when do you do it? So we went to Oakville Place Mall, and that's where we did some evangelism. It wasn't actually an intention to do that. We just went there. And so we're sitting in the coffee shop, and People next to us heard us talking about Cuba, and they said, oh, you're from Cuba. And he said, yeah, I'm a pastor. They go, oh. The next thing you know, Peter's witnessing to them and sharing the Lord with them because that's his gift. But the thing was was that you got to spend time, and you got to get to know people. you got to pray for people. So your Jerusalem is your neighborhood. Start off by getting to know who lives in all those houses or who lives in all those apartments or condos, and then begin to pray. And pray and say, Holy Spirit, open up a door. Make a way. We don't have to force ourselves onto people. And I think we've done the church and done the name of Jesus a lot of disservice by forcing it. We don't have to. We pray for divine appointments and the Lord will open and and they will ask questions. And then the Bible says we need to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. That's our job, to be witnesses. Now, there are evangelists that are called to that role and responsibility 
But not all of us or any of us in this room might be evangelists. But everyone here is to be a witness. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on. You can do. Everyone said, amen. amen. Because that's what Jesus was saying in this most important last words he gave to his church. So in Jerusalem, in Judea, Judea could be like Ontario. And there's lots of ministry opportunities within Ontario. Northern Ontario, there are aboriginal towns and places. And I know there are a lot of northern PAOC churches that would love to have a team come up and help them run their VBS or something else because they're small little rural churches and they don't have a lot of resources, people resources even. So there would be opportunity for you to do it in Judea. And then Samaria. Well, I mentioned Newfoundland, but the biggest Samaritans in Canada are from Quebec because they're Canadians, but they're not Canadians. They're Canadians, but they're not Canadians. So that's like Samaritans. They were Jewish, but they weren't Jewish. And so that's our Samaria. And interestingly enough, the most, one of the most unreached places in all the world in the, in the G7 countries is the province of Quebec. Needs to be reached. And you say, well, I don't know French. Well, you don't have to know French. Can you pray? And all those prayer times you've got, are you praying for Quebec? Are you praying for the people who God has called to minister in Quebec? And that's something that we could all do. And then finally, he says, to the ends of the earth. Many of you have come from the ends of the earth from our perspective <laughs> in Canada. But there's other places. And one of the ends of the earth that God led me to, after I'd done missions in many different Latin American countries, Caribbean in particular, was he led me to Cuba in 1990. We went down just for a, I call it a Joshua and Caleb trip, just to get to spy out the land and find out what was happening because the only thing most of us ever knew about Cuba was that they would hijack planes and go down there or that they were a communist country, that they were anti-democracy uh, and all that kind of stuff. All we knew is all this bad stuff about Cuba. But then our prime minister then, the father of Trudeau now, the Trudeau the father, he and Fidel were buddies and gone to the London School of Economics and knew each other and were pretty serious socialists. And so, but they were buddies and they sort of started to normalize relationships between Canada and Cuba because the U.S. had created an embargo, which is still in place, called the Helms-Burton Act. And so they cannot, regular, a church like this in the U.S. cannot go to Cuba as freely as we, they can go, but they have to go through a whole rigmarole to go down there. Unless you're a Cuban-American, then that's a, that's a whole different thing. But we can. If we wanted to, we could all go down to the airport right now, and if there's tickets available, we could buy a ticket and go to Cuba in this very moment. There's nothing stopping us. We have a divine responsibility, a divine opportunity as Canadians to be able to go there. Now, I've done missions in a lot of other countries, in Jamaica and, and, and to, to uh, Trinidad and Tobago and to Mexico and other places. And there's lots of missionaries there. There's lots of people from other countries. In fact, sometimes you feel like you're tripping over them. And that's how I ended up going to Cuba. I said, Lord, I'm tired of going to a place where everybody else is. There must be some place that needs us. And that's when he led us to Cuba. And nothing has really changed. I mean, the Helms-Burton Act is still in place. And the opportunity for us to go is still there. And so this is our opportunity to do something for the kingdom of God in this country. So Canada and Cuba, I call it partners in the harvest because we don't have to teach them how to do some things. But let me just tell you a few, few statistics. Okay, first of all, did you know Cuba is the largest island in the Caribbean? It's huge. It's about 1,400 kilometers long takes about two and a half days to drive from one end to the other. How do I know? Because I've done it <laughs> several times. And there's some nice highways in one chunk, and then the Russians ran out of money, and then boom, you go up and down and down and around. has a population of 11 million people. used to be 16 million, but 5 million of Cubans have fled the island. Until 1959, it was a democracy. And since then, it has a communist government whose official policy is atheism and still is. Now, they have come to tolerate the church because they couldn't stop it, but that's the official party line. And when they want to, they use that 
to control, manipulate, shut down, and do as much damage to the church as they can. Their objective in 59 was to wipe the church off the island, to totally get rid of it. And the Assemblies of God had a little over 300 churches at the time on the island, and it went down to less than 30. And they confiscated most of the buildings because the buildings were in U.S. people's names, and anything that wasn't in a Cuban national's name was confiscated. And so the, in terms of buildings, they got about 14 buildings that are actually a Assemblies of God church on Assemblies of God property, and that is their church. All the rest of the churches are house churches. Now, a house church just looks like something like this because they'll clear all the furniture out. They'll, in fact, the, the family will donate their living space on the ground floor and move upstairs, and they'll donate it all. And they'll get anywhere from 75 to 150 people jammed into one of those little spaces. So did you know those things about Cuba? Well, did you know? And I already told you some of this, but before 59, there were 400 Pentecostal churches down that went down to less than 30. Cuban pastors were arrested, deported, and put into labor camps. All foreign missionaries were deported. Most of the church buildings were confiscated. They went through, that was what Brother Hunter used to call the dark, the dark time. And that was from 59 until the 80s, about 20 years of darkness. But then God, next slide please, but then God. How many knows there's always a but then God? <laughs> Amen? Or just but God? And we thank God for the but gods in our lives and for the lives of our brothers and sisters in Cuba. That since 1988, Cuba has been experiencing one of the greatest revivals in church history. And in my doctoral work, I did study on mission, missiology and church revivals. And I have seen nothing like it anywhere in the world at any period in history. By 1990, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the perseverance and the power of the Holy Spirit, that number increased to 300. And this started in a little town called Madruga. It's just outside of Havana, maybe about 75 kilometers. But you think, what could happen in Madruga? Well, I read somewhere else. I said, what, what good could come out of Nazareth? <laughs> so what good could come out of Madruga? Well, God's spirit moved in Madruga, and signs and wonders began to happen, and things started to change. And they saw things that they never believed, and the government officials went there, and they saw things they never believed or understood and thought would possibly happen. And that started the revival in 88. But here's the interesting thing as I studied the Cuban revival. It started in Madruga and the Spirit of the Lord, and things went up. They went up to from 30 churches to 300, and then it seemed to plateau, and then God would show up somewhere else on the island. 99, that number went from... 1,300 to 1,500. And then in 2006, there were 3,000 churches. And today, the number is over 6,000 churches on the island of Cuba. I mean, if, 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 that, if, if that's not a, a worthy of a clap offering and a praise the Lord, I don't know what is. I mean, and how is this possible? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is a picture of a typical rural church. They'll put up some posts, they'll put up a thatched roof, they'll make some homemade pews, and they will have church. And that's a fancy one, because lots of times they just meet under trees. <laughs> but they, it doesn't matter to them. The building doesn't matter, the air conditioning doesn't matter. Well, oh, don't forget it. It, it, they don't, the fans don't matter. Air conditioning is neither is irrelevant. And, 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 then, and this is a thing, you know, and I, I have to constantly check myself because. I know you're not like this, and your people aren't like this, but the church I go to in Hamilton, they can be real whiners. They want, oh, it's too hot, Pastor. Oh, it's too cool, Pastor. Oh, uh, I hate the color of the carpet, Pastor. <laughs> Ay, caramba. So that's a typical rural church. Next. But most of it goes through a house church movement. As I said, they start in someone's house. They start with a prayer meeting. And then next thing you know, some people come. And, and there's this one in Las Palmas, which is just outside of, uh, uh, on the edge of Havana. There was this abandoned house. 
And so the only place that these three ladies said God called them to go and pray there, they didn't do it in the lower level because it was totally dilapidated. So they went upstairs and they called it the upper room. Boy, isn't that a neat idea. And these three ladies began to pray. Now you get three Cuban ladies praying in a house that has no windows and doors and the whole street can hear them praying. And they're praying and calling on God and calling on God. Next thing you know, four people are there, then five, then six, then 10 then 20 and then they said well we should we need a pastor so they got a hold of brother hunter and they said we've got this little gathering and is it possible that you could send us a pastor well he had a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law and so he sent them over there and that church the upper room the church in las palmas now is probably about 500 people Hallelujah. in that place that started off with a little house church three ladies in an abandoned building calling on God. That's the fervency of which it is. Now the next slide. Thousands of children have been a part of this. Everywhere you go, plenty nino, 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 nino. And we take stuff down. We carry down suitcases full of things, particularly for children, because a lot of tourist adults, they know, and they leave stuff, they're adult stuff, but they don't take stuff for, for, for ninos. And, 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 and there's a great ministry in Burlington that I, I partner with called Sew on Fire. And last year, somebody donated thousands of Crocs, you know, those little sandal things? And they wear like iron, and they're perfect for Cuba, and they weigh nothing in your suitcase. So we, we took down hundreds and hundreds of these baby Crocs, or little kids' Crocs, and we got them all for free from Sew on Fire. Thousands of children, and we take down materials for Sunday school and this and that. I mean, one of the things that used to be big in church, our churches back in the day was the flannel graph. And that's how you talk. And you had the little pictures, and you stuck them on the flannel board of Jesus and of, you know, Noah and all those different flannel graphs. Saying, well, now, of course, our kids look at flannel graph. Well, that's pretty lame. They want lights. They want sound. They want PowerPoint. They want the show. So flannel graphs are not so popular here anymore. So I put out a call, and uh, amazing to me, the number of churches that had a flannel graph rolled up and stuffed away somewhere in a closet, gathering dust, but they didn't want to throw it away. So anyway, we wound up, and we took down about 100 flannel graphs for teaching for children in Cuba, things that were useless to us here. So next slide. How is it possible? The Cuban church cannot advertise on radio, television, Newspaper cannot hold public crusades. They cannot go door to door, even though they do. It's illegal. They cannot share the gospel at work or in public places. So how is this growth possible? Where did we start off? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, not only is it power to be, a, to be, to be the witness, but it's the creativity to know how to witness, when to speak, and when to shut up. You know? So often we just want to tell our part. And you know the most important thing about being a good witness and being effective for the Lord? is to be a good listener. Watch how Jesus did it. He asked questions. He got to know them. You know, he got to know the, 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 the Samaritan woman at the well. He got to know the woman who was accused of adultery. He heard their stories. And then he entered into their stories because he was a good listener. So next slide, please. How is it possible? Because number one, they were willing. They were willing. And that sometimes is the most important thing goes back to, he said, you will. And in order for us to you will, what Jesus said, we have to be willing. Am I really willing? Am I willing to step out? Am I willing to speak the truth in love. Am I willing? So the Cubans were willing. And the first thing it did is that willingness brought them to their knees to pray. And I mean pray. They would pray and pray and pray and pray. And every assembly's church on the island, every Tuesday fasts and prays for God to move. Now, I know this isn't your church because I was watching on my way in. But I went to a big church, and first service had about 900 people. And it started at 930. 
And at 9.30, there were maybe 300 people there when the service started. And the other 600 sort of ambled their way in for the next 20 minutes, half an hour, till all 900 were there. The second service had about 1,500 people. Started at 11.11, and at 11.11, there were maybe 500 people there, and a 1,000 of them would make their way in over the next half hour or so. That was a regular occurrence. Now in Cuba, I would find them there an hour ahead, and they had to walk to get there. And they were on their knees, either on the concrete or on the dirt, calling on God. Now, if you're God looking down on this, now I know God isn't like this because he's much more gracious than I am. Um, where are you going to show up? Where the people are sort of wandering in a half hour, 20 minutes late? Or where they came an hour early saying, oh, God, please show up. Please meet with us, Lord. Please. And they're on their knees and they walk for an hour to get there. Where are you going to show up? And when I take people down and they see the miracles, the signs, the wonders, and the things that God is doing, they go, why isn't God doing this in Canada? You know? Are we willing? Do we want? So this brought them to their knees in prayer. And they wanted to receive the power of the Holy Spirit because if without that power, they were going to do nothing. They had no, they had no strength. They had no power to be witnesses in their Jerusalem. And so they understand the importance and the power of the Holy Spirit and to maintain that Holy Spirit relationship. Brothers and sisters, every morning I get up, I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Please empower me for what I need today. Without you, I can do nothing. And I got education, and I got 30 years of experience, and I got, and I got... And still, I recognize I have nothing without the Holy Spirit. I have nothing without the Holy Spirit. They were willing to sacrifice their personal freedom and property to be a witness for the gospel. If they're caught doing this, they could lose their house. They could lose their freedom. And right now, there are a million Cubans in prison. A million in prison. You know how many are in federal penitentiary? We have a population of what are we now? Forty million. We have about seventy-eight thousand people in federal penitentiaries in Canada. Cuba's a population of eleven million. They have a million in prison. You heard that back a time ago. There was a little bit of an out roaring about the changes and the bad things that were happening, and they arrested a thousand people and put them all in prison. 10% of their population is in prison. A lot of them are there because of their faith in Jesus Christ and trying to live the Christian life. But there's no religious persecution in Cuba. There's no religious persecution there. But when have you ever heard of a pastor getting arrested because the church broke the fire code and had too many people in the house? When in Canada have you ever heard of a pastor getting arrested and put in prison because the church was worshiping too loud and it disturbed the neighbors? But there's no religious persecution in Cuba. So how do they witness? What do they do? Well, I watched and I saw what they did is that they, you know, did that Jerusalem thing and, and I called it paella evangelism. Everybody here know what paella is? It's, it's, it's a wonderful Spanish dish, but really... It's, it's, it's leftovers. You go to your fridge or whatever's left. And I know there's an official recipe for it. But basically, it's leftovers. You put it into a big pan, and you put it with rice, and you bring it to a boil. And then you throw a little bit of saffron in it. Well, they don't got no saffron. But they put a little, and they make it look nice and make it a wonderful dish out of this thing called paella. And then they go to their neighbors. We'd like to share our meal with you. Why? Why would you do this? We know that no one... Everybody's, you know, you know what Cubans think about? I asked them, I said, what do you think about? And they said, well, well we're going to get our next meal. So, we're, so, so you're going to share your food with us? And they said, yes, we're Christians. And this is what God wants us to do, to share with you. If there's elderly people, they go and help them. They comb their hair. They wash their feet. They look after them. If there's a young mother with children and lots of abandoned children, 
and they take care of them and they look after them. Same things that we could do because we all know there are single moms, elderly people that live in our neighborhood, on our block, in our building. So this paella evangelism is to put faith into practical action and that's how they do it. And finally, to the ends of the earth. Did you know that COVID shut down the tourist industry and put 80% of the Cubans out of work and they still haven't recovered from that. Cubans up are lining up for eight to 10 hours to get their monthly ration, half a kilo of rice and beans, six eggs, et cetera, et cetera. Power is being shut off for 48 hours a day in most of the cities and towns. Who reported that over 2 billion families make less than $2.50 a day? And that's called extreme poverty by who? The World Health Organization, okay? Cubans are paid um, from the offerings of less than $30 a month, that's a dollar a day. So if extreme poverty is two fifty, dollars what's $1 a day? Extreme, extreme poverty. Cuban pastors do not receive a monthly salary from the government as their jobs are not recognized as an official job. So they live by faith. Did you know that during the pandemic, churches in Canada sent financial support for local churches and pastors and in their churches. So we, the door opened up for us to be able to send funds down very simply, very easily, which w was, w I'm sure wasn't the intent of the Cuban government, but it just worked out that way, that now instead of having to do bank drafts and a whole bunch of other rigmarole, we can put the money into somebody's account like that, all because of COVID. Thank you, Lord. That we kept in regular contact with the Cuban church and their leaders during all that time, encouraging them. Thank God for WhatsApp. That was our way to communicate with them. Canadian churches support the Cuban churches in prayer. And finally, to whom much is given, much is required. Brothers and sisters, whether you were born here in Canada or you came here to Canada, you won the lottery. You are in a blessed place to do so much. And to whom much is given, much is required. And much has been given to all of us. $30 a month can support a pastor and his family. $30. Now, I know a pastor went down there, and he, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the, the converted here, but it doesn't matter because you need to hear it, and you need to hear it from somebody other than your pastor. You're hearing it from me who's been there for more than 30 years. This is an opportunity for us as a church in Canada to do something significant for the kingdom of God. Finally, Canada and Cuba, we are partners in the harvest. They know how to catch them. They know how to evangelize them. They know how to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. But what they need is our help. They need our prayer support. Let me tell you, every time I've gone down and I've been somewhere and we brought down suitcases full of stuff and we've given them offerings, they said, Brother Empey, we appreciate those things. But most important of all, we appreciate that you've come, that you came. Because one of the things the enemy wants them to believe is that they're all alone and nobody in the whole world cares about them. And that's a lie from the devil. But we are there to be able to be witnesses. I have churches that support 15 churches in a presbytery. I have a call to adopt a presbytery. And that way it's structured and we know who we're helping. So no churches fall between the cracks. Because I've had churches from Canada go down and really bless one church. And there's a church half an hour or 20 minutes away with nothing. So this adopt a presbytery, and I have, so I have churches in Canada that adopt a presbytery. It's got 15 churches. It's got 12 churches. I just had a, ch a church in North York, Living Word, and, and, and they're, they're not even Canadians, or they're, they're Canadians, but they're all from Ghana and Africa, and they all went down. They have adopted 16 churches, you know? And so there's all these different churches in Canada that we've God's brought to our path to be able to support these churches on a regular basis because it's the regularity of it that's so critical. Not a little bit here and a little bit there, but regularly. And now with the new way we can do it, financially, we can send down offerings on a regular monthly basis. And so I would really encourage you to pray, talk to your pastor, and see how this church can be a blessing and to fulfill the words of Jesus and to be your, his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, your family, your neighbors, your friends, and even to the ends of the earth, whether it's in Sri Lanka 
whether it's in Cuba or someplace, but God has called us to be his witnesses. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this day, and we pray, Holy Spirit, we not just be hearers of it, but you will touch our hearts by what we have said, and that you will accomplish your will so that we can be your witnesses, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, not by might, not by our power, but by your spirit, that we can be your witnesses to our family, our neighbors, our friends, here in our Jerusalem, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you for pastor, and I thank you for this church, the privilege it is, Lord, to speak and share the good news with them. I pray thy kingdom come and thy will be done in this church, through this church, as it is in heaven, for your glory, your honor. And in your name, Jesus, amen. 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 May I ask you to stand as we are going to pray for Pastor, Pastor and his family and the ministry that they are doing, God is doing through them. May I ask you to raise your hands towards Pastor. Uh, Pastor, yeah, please, yeah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, great servant of you, Lord. Father, what a humble heart he has, Lord, and uh, the, the thirst that he has for those souls. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in his life, in his family, and we pray that your divine strength will continue to lead him, Lord. Keep him as a blessing, Lord. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God will guide him, Lord, every day. And Lord, uh, may many be blessed through him. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much. Such a such a blessing. You may be seated for a moment. I just want to pour out my heart a little bit. You may think that uh, maybe after Cuba visit, we had a plan, we discussed, and we brought Pastor to speak about Cuba. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that he was going to preach about uh, uh, discipleship and uh, you know helping churches across. We always say in our church, we speak the language of love. We are one family in Jesus Christ. This is one other good example. A lot of statistics, a uh, lot of uh, reports he mentioned about uh, Cuba, which was good. Uh, one thing pastor doesn't know is that we have already decided to adopt uh, or uh, sponsor 10 churches, pastor. We are in the process of, we are going to help 10 pastors in Cuba every month. Every month. And some of you have already contributed. We started collecting that fund and we are going to. But one thing that I learned is like you said about uh, we can directly deposit to their account or we can send. That is something that we can work it out. Pastor, that makes things easy for us. Praise be to God. And be a part of this. You know, one picture, I wish I had that picture that I could have shared uh, to the media team. The church should sponsor or help the hand of missionaries. And the missionaries will go and reach out to the lost souls. Like a picture, beautiful picture they put, you know, the sheep, somebody, the, the water is taking away the sheep, but this missionary is extending hand and holding that sheep. And the church is holding this missionary. What a beautiful illustration, isn't it? So as a church, we, we sponsor, we support the missionaries. And the missionaries, they go into the field, find out those lost souls. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Many of the things Pastor was mentioning, I could relate because we have literally seen that. Even last time when we came from Cuba, I was, please don't think it is all about Cuba, Cuba. Think about any country which will be going through this issue. Think about. Like there, people never asked for a second time food. They had, they were happy with what was served to them. They ate. That's it. They ate. I was wondering, how come these people can? Now we have all these, you know, complaints coming in here. Few things as pastor was speaking to me, like, I'm asking you this question. Are we in that 120? Are we in that 380 that they left after Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem? Question number one, because that's the first step I would say that. 30 years of experience, being a president of a Bible college, still he says that I have no power, I am nothing. I need the Spirit of God to guide me every day. So the, for that, you need to be in Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem, asking the Spirit of God for guidance. What should I do? When to speak? When not to speak? 
and second thing he mentioned and it was it was really touching me sometime we may be in the upper room but we may be doing the research instead of waiting upon the spirit of god scholarly research who said this where from this came paul said peter said this that who said that are we waiting upon the spirit of god to lead guide empower us second thing and then check your your you know let us check examine our activity how much time i am spending in the church how much time i am spending in the parking lot how much time i am spending with the gossip and talking and other stuff unless otherwise we submit unto the lord i tell you we will not be witnessing god or jesus christ his blood that was shed on the cross would be wasted i tell you and lastly i would tell you one last thing i would tell you when you know somebody who who claims that they know christ who claims that they know christ they know the scripture but their lifestyle is not according to the word of god please don't try to put your pressure on them don't waste your time on them you know why it is the spirit of god going to convict them and bring them Amen. humanly speaking we cannot do anything we try, we are trying to you know prove to people that we are good holy we are trying to help them no we are wasting our time and energy the spirit of god has spoken to me this some time back he said james you do your work salvation is mine like i would touch them i will speak to them if he is not going to change if he or she is not going to change after so many years he is not going to change leave leave them to me there are hundreds or thousands or millions of souls out there go and reach them people walking for hours to come and be in the presence of god asking for the presence of god in the church walking miles why do we waste our time going and sitting and talking with them blah 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 all unnecessary stuff god is watching us please and pastor many things what you spoke our church is after those discipleship or we go and reach out to people you know bring the souls to and we don't have time like christ is coming so soon we don't have time for all the other stuff so with that i would say that we are going to have the baptism service very soon if you are one of those people that i want to be baptized today is the day step up step up and submit unto the lord i remember the the book the, the verse from isaiah he says lord is asking whom shall i send and who will go for us are you that person today hey, come on pastor i have been baptized i have been in the church for so many years is is my life is my lifestyle telling somebody that i am a child of christ am i witnessing christ if not there is no point you know we calling ourselves christ you know it's christian 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 come on how beautifully he said going to houses food of food from the fridge refrigerator taking making it a good food and then going and serving helping the neighbor or helping the neighbor's child or the elderly people can you can you guess that's happening in canada is it happening in canada no is it happening in india sri lanka no everyone is so selfish so you know self centered oh i want this i want that i'm not blaming here but the spirit of god is putting that burden in my heart that that was the church that harvested thousands and thousands of souls from 300 they went to 3000 churches how is it possible because of their action led by the guidance of the holy spirit it's time for us to examine our christian life my dear children lord was asking who shall whom shall i send and they say, and I, he the prophet said let me go lord i will go lord if you are that person i want you to stand today not to me not to anybody here but committing to the lord your commitment unto the lord saying that lord i want to do something for you lord i tell you god has blessed us with one or the other gift in us if it is your singing if it is your even if it is something about your cleaning dedicate that for the kingdom of god i tell you i tell you four plus years i was running back and forth scarbro and missaga scarbro and missaga i was committed unto the call of the lord and today i am standing as a minister as a pastor in a church because god saw that faithfulness 
the dedication it's not today right from my young age god is calling you i know some of you are neglecting you are pushing away okay i can do it later who knows tomorrow is reserved for you who knows anything that you want to do that is to be today today may i ask you close your eyes and examine yourself and if the spirit of god is putting that burden in your heart come on you have to you have to commit unto the lord saying that lord from today onwards uh, i want to do something for you lord thank you jesus thank you lord hallelujah hallelujah glory heavenly father we thank you thank you lord i the lord of sea and sky i have heard my people cry all who dwell in dark and sin my hand will save i who made the stars of night i will make the darkness bright who will bear my light to them whom shall i say here i am lord is it i lord i have heard you you calling in the night i will standing those who are giving a commitment unto you lord lord i pray that once you called me lord once you called the pastor gary once you called the pastors here you've been faithfully leading us lord all these years you're doing supernatural things lord that we have not even imagined and today lord i pray that these children as they are standing praying bless them lord make them a mighty weapon in your hands lord use them mightily lord oh rabba shikur in de re bo shudo re yes lord the little step that they are taking today lord may it see mighty results lord walk with them for miles lord abo shudo re in de re riyan de re bo shukur to re in de re 
you know the, the spirit of god is telling me some of you say that i cannot do this because i am old i am not educated i don't have the resources i don't know how god is asking are you ready and willing to submit unto me my child if you submit unto him he will take you if a man like me can stand and minister do greater things if the god can make saul to paul he is mighty to change you today your weaknesses your shortfalls is not an obstacle to do the will of god in your life surrender to him this day surrender to him hallelujah because he lives i can face to all
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. My Jesus lives. Hallelujah. My life is safe in his hands. Hallelujah. I have to die. I have to die. Myself has to die. I should be born again in Jesus. Amen. Amen. He will. He will take me to miles. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. How sweet is thy presence, Lord. Thank you for the words of assurance that you are speaking to some of us in this house. Riyakere bo shoto re de re re di gandere. Riyandere bo shoko ro do re de riya. Let that fire glow in us, Lord. Riyakere bo shoto re riyandere bo. Hallelujah. Because we live, I can face tomorrow. Hallelujah. Because we live, you let the fear be gone from you. Fear is gone. Because I know. Thank you. Thank you for holding our future. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that heavenly blessing be ever be upon everyone in this house, Lord. Thank you for that compulsion that uh, you have reminded in our hearts today. Step out and go and reach those unreached. make me an instrument lord to bring those lost souls to come to your kingdom bless everyone in this house lord be with them guide them throughout this week until we meet again in jesus most precious name amen 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 shall we shall we all shout out a hallelujah unto the lord hallelujah. amen hallelujah not enough Hallelujah glory to God you may be seated for a second i think the sunday school kids are going to uh, can you yeah they they are not ready i believe uh, quickly so uh, once again i want to thank you pastor gary very profound uh, message thank you may god bless you i wish you come yeah praise be to god i wish you come often as often as possible and uh, please those who are interested in theological studies yeah remain pastor is going to take some questions from you if you have any doubt any question you can ask um, dr gary is going to ask some uh, you know give you the clarification and after that and after that we also have the sunday school or the vbs volunteers please stay back we have a very short meeting very short meeting 10 15 minutes not more than that the volunteers who have registered who have given your name for the vbs come sisters please bring them in bring them in yeah we are yeah come 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 yeah hallelujah so so please uh, those theo- those who are interested in theological studies one and then the sunday school or vbs uh, volunteers come sisters come yeah so i think we have the small ones going to sing a song or brothers uh, someone can help taking the podium off and out of the pulpit from here so they can stand and sing thank you thank you mom please please yeah thank you
Praise the Lord. We are very grateful and thankful uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ for leading this kids' church for the last six months. And this year, we focused on the character traits for each and uh, every kid through the Bible story. And uh, we covered Bible portion based on the characters like compassion, not telling lies, how prayer is important for them, and fear only God. So those topics we have covered. And these little ones, they learned action songs and they're going to perform those action songs here it's the bible verse that they're going to perform with action so let's clap hands for this little one whatever they learned in the sunday school they're going to perform before you guys thank you Give a hand, give a hand to our little ones, yeah? <laughs> Praise God. Good job. Thank you.
Thank you, teachers, for training them. Praise God. So, with that, we can uh, call it a day. Like we we are <laughs> we are going to greet each other. And uh, please, there are a little snack out there. Go to the fellowship room. Greet each other, especially the Tamil English. If you do not know anybody, make friends. Just uh, uh, check with. Or if you have anyone has a prayer request, you may come and meet me. I can pray for you. Now, uh, brothers, once you are done, you let me know. Pastor Gary is going to be here, here in, in the sanctuary. Those who want to move, move to the 